I said before, um, style of dentistry I do is called biomimetic restorative dentistry. Um, how I fell into it was kind of during lockdown and COVID, um, finding out this side of dentistry that existed and kind of answers a lot of questions on why it's so important to treat teeth individually um, and treat them bespokely and not just coffee and paste dentistry. Um, a lot of patients and a lot of um, institutes and universities believe in crowning a lot of structured compromised teeth, um, whereas following this approach it allows you to have a predictable kind of workflow um, and also um, enables you to not kind of worry about should I be removing this part of the tooth, what kind of restoration should I be doing. And in day-to-day -day dentistry, when you get out of dental school, but even at dental school, I wish I would have done a lot more of these restorations and this lecture hopefully answers some of these um, questions for you. So the style of dentistry, biometric restorative dentistry, there's kind of six parts to it, which um, Dr. David Allenman, the founder of biometric, uh, biometric restorative dentistry touches on. Um, lesson one to six, lesson one carries removal endpoints, which I touched on in my last lecture for Dentinet. Um, lesson two is cut, um, gaps and cracks into dentine, um, which we'll be touching on today. Lesson three is immediate dentine sealing and resin coating of dentine and um, actual preparations, which we'll touch on today as well. Uh, lesson four is about controlling the C factor and stresses on the tooth, which overlay and onlay preparations will do, which we'll touch on. Lesson five is preparation and bonding to enamel and preparations, which is about onlay preparations. And lesson six is about occlusion and that can go on forever. So we won't touch on that. So first of all, kind of really just touch on lesson two and lesson five. So the thing that we'll be talking about is risk um, assessment for structure compromised teeth. Um, day to day, you see patients come in with large fillings, mainly large metal fillings we'll touch on, even large white fillings. You see nowadays patients, especially clinicians, I feel, because we use composites so often in dental school, um, I feel that we go so used to doing such large resin restorations when maybe we should be looking at partial coverage ceramics or partial coverage restorations like composite onlays instead. Um, because if we don't take into account the C factor and the shrinkage of large resin restorations, we run the risk of leaking restorations, but also restorations that are prone to fracture. So following the one, two, three, four analysis, um, the first point is cracks and gaps into dentine. So looking for cracks in the restorations, things that could show you there's potential cracks and gaps into dentine. Um, two is the isthmus width of the restoration. So if the width is greater than two millimeters of the restoration, there's actually about a 60% increase in chance of um, risk of fracture of the tooth or the tooth is about 60% weaker than the natural tooth. Measuring the base of the cusps in the restoration, um, I have an instrument called an Watson gauge, so you can actually measure the depth and width of the cusps that are left, but basically base of the cusp, if it's any less than three millimetres for the ones that are really at risk, um, you should overlay those cusps and we'll go into why. And part four of the risk assessment is if the box depth of the restoration, um, especially in the mesial distal aspects of the proximal boxes, if that's less, if it's greater than four millimetres, then it encroaches on the area called the bio rim. And the bio rim is an unpredictable area in the tooth to bond to, but also stresses um, and bonding unpredictability. And again, the C factor in this area is something you need to take into account. Um, but also you've had a lot of loss of the dental enamel junction, which we'll talk about quite a bit today and this stress relief that the DEJ aids in the tooth. So first of all, cracks into dentine. So the, the first part of the structural analysis, there's around six different types of cracks we'll go into. Um, part six I didn't put on, but um, we'll go into that. So the first one of the six cracks is peripheral rim fractures, which are into enamel. Peripheral rim fractures are kind of the, when you have a large restoration, like a large class one in the middle of the tooth, and you have a rim of enamel around the outside, you get these crack and fracture lines starting. Peripheral rim fractures allow bacteria to ingress into them through micro leakage um, and they manifest due to lot, lot of clues or stress on the actual um, peripheral rim of the enamel due to loss of the middle enamel of the tooth and the dentine that's been removed. The analogy I use a lot to patients and some one of my friends and colleagues use as well is if you like have a, say a tin can, the tin can's nice and strong when it's got its contents in the lid on, but if you remove the lid, the tin can can then flex. And this analogy is, shows that why the actual rim of the tooth flexes and you get cracks in. So any large class one, class two restorations, any thin actual marginal ridges that are left 
always look at the peripheral rim and the, a lot of the time you'll see these cracks which you'll see on the next page. So if you see on this picture, on the distal of the six, well, I don't, it might not be a six, it might be a five, you can see this peripheral rim fracture, um, large class one restoration on the mesial and the distal of both of them, there's peripheral rim fractures. And you can see darker the stain of the crack, the longer it's been there, and the longer and more profound the ingressive bacteria has been to cause decay. A lot of white cracks are okay because a lot of the time there's no ingress. However, dark stain cracks, a lot of the time when you remove the restoration, you'll see a lot of staining and decay at the DJ margin. And this is where you'll get a lot of kind of spreading of decay, undermining of cusps, especially in restorations that you probably didn't think were as big or needed as much removal or preparation as before. Second types of cracks are delamination. Delamination is a loss of enamel and material between the restoration and the cusp. A bit like abfraction lesions um, in tooth surface loss, when you get kind of occlusal loading and forces on a weaker area, you get sheared away of enamel. And this is the same between these two areas, lightly between unbonded restorations like amalgam restorations and also the cusps of the teeth. So the natural movement of the cusps and natural under normal occlusion of the teeth causes micro movements and then over time due to the non-bonded nature of the restoration in large occlusal restorations, especially amalgams, you get loss of um, the actual occlusal enamel and they get ingress and undermining of the cusps. Second, third type of crack is oblique fractures. These are the most common cause, it cause, causes of fractures. About 80% of the fractures that probably come are oblique cusp fractures. They're the ones you see on a day-to-day -day basis. Patient says they've come in, they've lost some filling, they've lost some tooth, normally oblique fracture. The fractures are most common on the tension cusps, which we'll go into. Tension cusps being the lingual of the lower and the buccal of the upper due to the actual occlusal forces and how the actual teeth occlude. Types of cracks four and five. So you've got mesial distal fractures, which you can see on the top picture, mesial peripheral rim to the um, filling across, to the other filling and down through the other marginal ridge. These fractures are really common because of, like again I said, the nature of the peripheral rim fractures and also a large clusal fillings. Um, there's a newer style of crack which has been coined poison effect fractures. This is due to compression of the dentine immediately below large metal restorations. There's no um, enamel or dentine to take the compressive forces from even, even just natural um, biting forces in the occlusion and over time it causes compressive load of the dentine which shouldn't have to take these pathological forces which the enamel would normally do. Also the DEJ would normally redirect these forces um, and not allow the dentine to crack in such a way. And number six on this is um, traumatic cracks and fractures due to trauma or injury um, but they're not too important in this as much as these ones are which probably go undiagnosed most of the time. Part two of structural analysis is the isthmus width. So the isthmus width of the restoration, if people don't know what the word isthmus is, then it is, if you look at the size of the metal filling on this picture here, um, the metal filling is massively wide at the back, but the isthmus here is always greater than two millimeters in the metal fillings because the issue is when you're packing in an amalgam filling or when people did in the past, the normal GV black style restorations, which are those style of restorations you're taught on clinical skills when you first start dental school, they always teach you to make it big enough to fit your amalgam packer in. And that's definitely greater than two millimeters. And that's, um, and that's why most of the restorations are greater than two mil. There's a lot of evidence that talks about these um, subocclusal transverse ridges in the teeth. Um, and these were termed Rainey ridges by Tim Rainey in his 1996 landmark paper. Um, Subocclusal transverse ridges are like a spider web network connection within the enamel um, that keep the tooth connected side to side, back to back, front to front. And when you have a restoration greater than two millimeters in width, you lose these interconnections and then you lose connections between the cusps and the teeth. And this is what makes the risk of cracks and fractures of teeth especially in compromised teeth with big fillings of high risk. So like I said before, in any restoration that takes away these occlusal, um, subocclusal transverse ridges, uh, you have a reduction in strength of the tooth. It's a 60% reduction when you have a cusp width greater than two millimeters. And there were studies done by Pascal Mane and Belser in 2002 that looked at um, 
the stresses on teeth when the restoration was greater than two millimeters. And they found that when you lost these rainy ridges, there was a disconnecting between the actual holding cusp, which is the functional cusp, and the tension cusp, which is the one that is prone to fracture. And when you have a disconnection between the two, even under normal forces, you get a lot of oblique forces on the tension cusps, which are the lingual lowers and the buccal upper, and that's what causes your oblique fractures and your cracks to form. So that's what I was about to say here. So on the natural tooth, the micro movements within the natural tooth are in the range of three microns, and this is what Manio and Oganesson in 2009 found. And in a cavity with an isthmus greater than two millimeters, so in most treated teeth, the micro movements of the teeth are that up to 175 microns. Um, so you can see there's a massive change in the actual flexing of the tooth when it's been cut or been restored. In teeth that have had amalgam fillings, the evidence shows that there is more or less no difference in having an open cavity to having an amalgam filling in the tooth. The micro movements are no different. So that's why even with a metal filling in the tooth, as I say to my patients, your options are a metal filling or a bonded filling or a bonded composite or a bonded overlay or no restoration. The metal filling is just going to fill the space. It's not going to strengthen the tooth. If anything, it's going to be just filling the space, prevent sensitivity and to just remove the, and to fill in the area of the decay. Whereas a bonded filling, um, evidence shows that the micro movements in bonded restorations are within the biometric range. And that's of seven to eight microns. So it's a lot, lot closer to the normal tooth compared to a metal filling. So part three of this, we're looking at the different um, widths of the cusps and the and types of cusps. So part three is the base of the cusp is less than three millimeters. So in teeth, um, there's two types of cusps. There's basically holding and tension cusps. Holding cusps are the ones that are held in occlusion. So on the, on the top, it is the um, palatal cusp and on the lower, it is the vocal cusp and they're the ones that will lock into each other. And the other cusps are your tension cusps. So it's your lingual lower cusps and your buccal upper cusp, and that's your ball rule again. So if you want to know which cusps are prone to fracture and the ones that you need to make sure are thicker than three millimeters to keep, remember the ball rule. Um, and like I said, tension cusps are the cusps that are the most prone and most likely and run the risk of fracture. And 80% of the cracks occur in the tension cusps. Um, I had a clean break on a non tension cusp the other day. Um, so there are definitely ones that happen on them as well. Um, like I said, 80% of the cracks occur in the tension cusps, and this isn't even parafunctional. Um, even under normal clusal forces, 80% of the force is placed on the tension cusps. And because the force on these cusps isn't locked in, like on the holding cusps, the actual um, load is oblique, and that's why these cusps experience lateral forces and cracks occur under the cusps, or you get complete shearing of the cusp. Um, the picture on the right is my Watson gauge. Um, it's like a little caliper, I've got a full picture, but the two points you can put either side of the cavity in the tooth and you can actually measure it. You can get these on eBay for like three quid and they're really, really good. But obviously in dental school, they're gonna need to be autoclave. So there's no real point in getting them. Um, the tension cusps need to be thicker than three millimeters. Uh, and that's because if they're any less than that, they're 80% more prone to fracture. Um, and the holding cusp, the really thick ones that are actual don't take much oblique forces, they can be less than two millimetres. But in a lot of cases, if they're really thin and I'm worried about them, I'll always reduce them by whatever restorative material size I want and overlay them to make sure that I'm not having a patient come back with a cracked tooth after I've done a restoration. It's just peace of mind. But anything less than three, it's always going to go. So um, the reason for this is because the um, cusps less than three millimeters, they actually flex a hell of a lot more than cusps that are greater than that. And this is due to kind of hydration of the cusps. So a cusp less than three millimeters would be termed a dry cusp. And this is because the restoration that's in the tooth is causing the tooth to be this thin, will cut the cusp off from any pulpal fluid that's flowing into the dentine tubules. Um, and it just means it's a dry cusp. These cusps, like I said, flex three times more and are more prone to fracture. The reason why we shouldn't onlay cusps greater than 3.5 millimeters is because even though they can potentially strengthen the cusp, the risk of catastrophic failure to that tooth and complete breakage potentially below the gingival level 
or complete breakage into the pulpal, like a pulpal fracture, um, is a lot higher. There was a study done by Fennis in 2004, and you can see on the table in the bottom right, potentially more fractures um, occurred which were unrestorable below the CJ area. Um, and this obviously is a reason of, even though we've strengthened them, we don't want catastrophic failures. And onto the final part of structural analysis. Um, so when the proximal box is greater than the four millimeters, um, the DEJ is lost in this area and we actually encroach in an area called the biorim. So four millimeters deep into the tooth, we encroach on the biorim, and this is actually an area of tension in the tooth. So the tooth is termed a, bio, a, bio, um, a compression dome. There's a study on this, and there's quite a lot of stuff about compression domes and how teeth mimic this, but the actual picture on the right-hand side, the article is no longer available on the internet for some reason, but it explains that any restoration or any part of the tooth that's higher up on the tooth is in compression, and this is what we want. Anytime the restoration flows down into the deep proximal box in the area of the biorim, the tooth's in tension. And this is why it's a lot harder to predictably bond the materials down into here, bonding ceramics, bonding metals. The tooth doesn't flex in, in this area as normal. So we want to try and mimic this area as much as possible. And this is where we would use um, techniques like deep marginal elevation or cervical, um, cervical margin repositioning, same thing with a composite resin first to lift the margin in these deep boxes um, and also using a resin in this area like composite to bond to is a lot easier because you can predictably bond the composite first, get the bio room restored and then bond your restoration afterwards. And this just means that your restoration isn't bonded in tension, but it's more likely to be bonded in area of compression, which is less likely to fail over time. Okay, in these areas, like I said at the very start, this is where you're potentially removing a lot of the dental enamel junction. And the dental enamel junction in this area is extremely important in, in stress propagation um, and producing um, kind of a cushion for the tooth, which if you have a deep box greater than the four millimeters, as Pascal Mane and Bezos in 2011 said, you're reducing the tooth's natural um, shielding mechanism. And this is why um, teeth with boxes greater than the four millimeters are at risk of structural compromise. So the analysis done on this was something called Moray fringe analysis. Um, and all it really is, is that they do tests on teeth. They look how close the fringes are together, which just shows stress in the teeth. The thicker the zones in the fringes represent increased stress and the tighter they are together represents increased stress. So if you look around the CJ, where at the deep proximal box where C is on the bottom left, you can see the fringes are very, very close together. And you can see that in the deep enamel on the outside of the tooth there, the fringes are quite thick. So around this proximal box area, if you lose the DEJ or the enamel or the um, areas of natural tooth in this area, you're losing a lot of potential stress reduction in the DEJ. Um, on the tooth, if you see, the stress goes directly down into the enamel. And then at the DEJ, the stress of the teeth is actually pushed sideways into the AE dentine. And this is what helps prevent a lot of catastrophic failures. And this is why the tooth naturally is very good with coping with forces in the teeth. Remove the DJ, the forces no longer propagate into the dentine, and the dentine will either be hypercompressed and get cracks into dentine, or you'll get a catastrophic failure. So this is a reason why, again, if we lose a lot of DJ, or if we do heavy preparations like crown preparations that remove all the DJ, you're massively weakening the tooth. And there was a study recently by Gray Militich as well, um, which explained that potentially crowns are reducing the structural strength of teeth by two to three times due to the loss of the actual DJ. So in the lecture, I got people to pick out what they could see, but I'll kind of run through it and hopefully get it right. Far left picture, I think this probably carries on the five distally. There's a large occlusal class one amalgam with a mesial peripheral rim fracture distal peripheral rim fracture, isthmus greater than two millimeters, um, and the staining around there and the chalkiness would likely make me think there's decay started under there, as saw in the picture of the peripheral rim fracture. Cusp wise, a lot of the amalgams are undermined, so the likelihood of this cusp being quite thin when removing is quite high, but potential the other cusps are quite thick. So I'd be looking at how much tissue is left lingually 
we're measuring. This seven as well, large class one. I think there's a peripheral impacture there, but this doesn't look too compromised other than the very large width. The five has a peripheral rim fracture and a deep box. Here, the four does, sorry, the five is a deep box. And then again, the six, large filling and amalgam is a cusp, which is never good and a massive isthmus. And then the thickness of this distal cusp here, distal palatal is very thin. So the likelihood of that fracturing is quite high. On the far right, peripheral rim fracture, large isthmus, let me move my picture. And then again, cusp of amalgam, which is prone to fracture. So these are really structurally compromised teeth. And instead of just doing large resin restorations where you're not taking into account C factor, or if you're not, um, or other restorations where people would say potentially crown this, you can now selectively analyze these teeth and know when and where to keep. Um, and again, if you hear the six fracture at the rim, these middle ones, large isthmus, four and five were peripheral rim fractures, and the lower right seven, peripheral rim fracture, even on the smallish central amalgam. So a little case discussion. So this was one of the ones that came to me. So it was a six with a large um, MO amalgam, isthmus greater than two millimetres, and the mesial box greater than four millimetres deep. And at this point, I was thinking, how thick are these cusps that remain? Because realistically, the undermined amalgam will cause these cusps to be thick, to be thin, sorry. Like I said, again, measuring the isthmus here is greater than two millimeters. So you've got a re reduction in fracture resistance by 60%. Meso marginal ridge lost, one marginal ridge reduction in the strength of the tooth by 47%. And again, large occlusal or extended restoration, loss of the rainy ridges, and the tooth no longer connected back to back, front to front, side to side. And again, like I said before, an amalgam, an unbonded restoration, the tooth may as well not have a restoration in it from my point of view. Looking at the cusps, so the holding cusps here and the um, tension cusps here on the left, um, if they're less than three millimetres, reduce them completely um, by two millimetres for, say, the Emacs that I used. And if these are less than two millimetres, reduce them by two millimetres in height for the Emacs. Um, if the cusps were greater than 3.5 millimetres, like I said before, due to the risk of catastrophic failure, then I'd be keeping them. Again, deep boxes, does it encroach on the biorim? Do I need to do a deep margin elevation with composites? All things I'm thinking. Hierarchy of bondability. Um, this is something I touched on in the first lecture I did, where there's stress and struggle between the bonding of enamel and dentine. Enamel takes five minutes to meet, reach its maximum bond strength, or 80% of its bond strength, whereas dentine takes over half an hour to meet its maximum bond strength. So there's a struggle. If you connect the dentine and enamel straight away in these deep boxes, you'll get stress away from the dentine bonding, Due to, the, um, due to the shrinkage towards the enamel, and you'll get loss of um, bond strength by about 80%, and you'll end up with leakage down there. Um, also in the deep boxes, there's ununiform enamel prisons, and this is an unpredictable area to bond, so you'd never um, bevel your margins here. You'd always do a butt joint for your actual restoration. Um, something I like to touch on a lot of the time with these preparations is caries dye. So caries dye is an indicator of denatured collagen, which happens in the bacterial um, breakdown of collagen and in the caries process. Um, it allows you to visualize where the decay is in the teeth, um, but also allows you to know where, uh, where you are potentially wanting to leave decay. In deep caries lesions, you should always leave decay, especially over the pulp. Um, there's certain measurements um, on Pascal Marnie and Alleman's paper in 2012 called Carriers Removal Endpoints. Um, it's a really good paper. I'd say go and read it. It was a thing that you can change overnight. Um, if you're constantly removing complete carriers, if you read that paper, you won't remove carriers completely. And it's something you can change and make your dentistry better overnight. More or less says that in evidence shows in over 2000 teeth, the measurements deeper than five millimeters. Um, into the tooth and deeper than three millimeters from the side of the tooth. At this point, if you remove caries past this, you must increase the risk of causing um, an exposure. 
So if you remove all caries outside this area and leave caries in it, you actually produce something called a caries removal endpoint or a soft zone. And the area around it is called your peripheral seal zone. This peripheral seal zone allows high maximum bond strengths, but also allows you to um, seal in your, your caries, which won't progress and will maintain um, port vitality. Outer caries dentine will stain dark red and inner caries dentine will stain with a pink hue. Sound dentine doesn't stay. Okay. So this is a little table. So outer caries dentine that is pink, um, you want to completely remove because the bond strength is awful. However, if it's um, within those measurements that I just stated, you want to leave it. Inner caries dentine, caries dentine that's bang over the pulp actually has quite a high bonding to it, studies would show. So there's no issue with leaving in a carious dentine as long as you're producing that zone around the tooth that's completely clean and having a clean um, DEJ as well. So this is the preparation after the um, class um, two restoration was removed. The cusps were reduced down by um, two millimeters because they were too thin. And then I did something called immediate dentine sealing. Immediate dentine sealing is um, applying bond over your dentine. Uh, there's two school of thoughts. Some people do it over their dentine, some people do it over dentine and enamel, um, but there's not a lot of difference in it. Um, what it will do is uh, increase the bond strength of your indirect restoration by about 400%. So you'd etch and then you'd bond the tooth ideally with a gold standard bonding agent. There's a few out there. There's Optibond FL, which I like to use, which is a three-stage um, bonding system. So etch, prime, and bond. There's another one called Clearfill SC. That's a two-stage system, which is a self-etching primer, where you use the primer to etch, and then you add the bond afterwards. And that can be a little bit more kinder on deep lesions, apparently. Um, these gold standard bond agents will allow you to get the highest um, microtensile bond strengths and allow your restorations to be as strong as possible. I know in dental schools we don't have these, so use your bond as normal, and then you should do something called a resin coat. A resin coat is a 0.5 millimeter layer of flowable composite over the dentine after bonding. This will reduce um, the chance of um, your hybrid layer being pulled away over time because you'll allow time for your bond to mature to the hybrid layer but also there's evidence of pull pull fluid pressure on these non-gold standard bonding agents the actual pull pull pressure can actually cause issues with the hybrid layer but if you actually resin coat it the pull pull pressure isn't strong enough to cause issues so in dental school with non-gold standard bonding agents or even if you don't have them in practice you should probably resin coat afterwards and this will allow your restorations to be a lot stronger so this is what I said, resin coat is a flowable composite over the dentine. It allows a restorative interface to glue your onlay or your restoration to. You should do this in your resin restorations, your composites as well, but only over the dentine. Don't connect your enamel at this point because you'll have the issue with the shrinkage towards the enamel. You get bond strengths within the 30 megapascal range. And like I said, it allows the maturation of the hybrid layer. And Dr. David Allerman has lots of evidence on this. Um, and I'll go through some Instagram profiles if someone reminds me at the end, because I forgot to do that the other day when I was lecturing. This is the workflow. So two starts, not a crown preparation, amalgams removed, cusps are reduced two millimeters. All the way around this tooth, you still have an enamel margin to bond to. And this is the resin coat, and it can still bond to the complete enamel margin. Um, Ignore the fact it's not polished on the picture, but this is an onlay Emax press lithium disilicate. Um, good, strong restoration. Um, don't need zirconia ever in, in actual any dentistry. There's a lot of evidence that shows that zirconia can crack teeth because of it's too strong. Um, so you want ideally um, a material that mimics um, the enamel well. Um, so Emax is good and it has the similar um, compressive strengths and tensile strengths to enamel, a little bit stronger though. Um, when cementing, I always cement everything, and I prepare everything under rubber dam. Um, I just think, what would I want for my tooth best? And also, I don't get how you can treat without complete moisture isolation. It's really tricky. So cement it with heated composite at 55 degrees. Um, it becomes more um, fixotropic and will flow 
fill voids but also is a nice looting cement it has evidence that it has the exact same um, cementing properties um, as Panavia V5 so it's got a very good um, microtensile bond strength and will allow a good bond but also you have the, um, the benefit of reduced margin degradation over time because it's a restorative material so if you can heat composite you can do it I used to do it even in dental school so if you take the casing out the light on your unit and fill it with composite that will heat so that works as well just don't get told off for it i guess um and these really are kind of just more pictures and on the when i lectured before it's for you kind of to have a minute and just go through in your head what i spoke about um, and with these pictures to be able to just pick out individual things on the teeth and start to really make you purposely think about how you would treat these teeth rather than potentially just doing massive composites or crowning teeth that don't need to be crowned. And I'll put them back up if you want to have a little think. Okay.